Real quick, I wanna show you something before we get into this head extreme tour review. I tried to get some footage of me stretching my calves on my slant board here. Now check this slant board out. I actually got grip tape on here so that it grips me and my feet better, but look, it's modular. Now we got two of them at less of an incline, but we also have three of them. Anyway, this product is so good and it's in my Amazon storefront. But I really, really wanna stress the importance of stretching your calves. You're jumping around a lot. You're running around a lot. The calves take an absolute beating. Oh, that feels so good. That is a nice, nice deep stretch. Also, stretching your calves is so important for ankle mobility. I think having a product like this can really help keep the body in the shape that it needs to be. I also have another one here made of foam and I keep this at my desk. That way my heel or my toes, I should say, are slightly elevated when I'm sitting. So that really, really helps. So poke around on the Amazon storefront page a little bit and you'll see these and more there. All right, guys, let's get into the video. But first, look at this pink racket. Ooh, what is this? Any guesses? Any guesses? Any guesses? It's not a prototype but it is a custom paint job. I'll let you guys think about that. I'm actually gonna take my car out because it just rained outside and I've missed the rain. So let's get out of here and into the nice wet outdoors. And that's where I'll do this review. <laughs> All right, here we are in the great outdoors. Nice and wet. Ooh, you guys ready for this? Ho, 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 ho. Oh yeah, so many water droplets. Look at how dirty this car is. I almost washed it yesterday, but I'm glad I didn't because raindrops. Yeah, when that all dries, it's gonna be so dirty looking. Here's how you open these. And this is where I will place the phone for now. Oh yeah, you know I get crazy with it, by the way. Look at those red and blue petals, purple lights. It's kind of a pink or purple. They're actually defective and they flicker a little bit, but I don't care. I gotta get rid of this, but I got a knockoff GameCube controller. Does anyone still play GameCube? You can play video games in this car, which is important because sometimes you're sitting there charging the car, which actually doesn't take nearly as long as people think, but some stations, which are free a lot of the times, will charge your car at like maybe 25 to 35 miles an hour. There's actually a mall nearby that I park at a lot. I get free parking there and free charging there. It charges my car at almost 40 miles an hour, which you know isn't necessarily fast, but I'm gonna be at this place for like one, two, maybe three hours. Sometimes I go on a run or I do laptop work there. Or I just go there to hang out and <laughs> stretch. <laughs> Who knows, people watch, etc. But you might be in a situation where it's nice to play some video games. Anyway, I've been playing this new one way too much. Makes me think I should get rid of that controller. All right, let's get these headphones in, which are USB-C with a microphone, which I also have on my Amazon storefront. I can leave a link to this other mic that I have in my Amazon storefront as well. All right, for anybody wondering, this is why I have one driving glove because as I have revealed now, I'm driving a Tesla and I got a big old screen in the center. Actually, I'll go ahead and show you just in case you haven't seen one before. Yeah, look at that giant screen. Here's my hand for reference. Think I wanna get thumbprints all over that? You're crazy. And so I wear a driving glove. You guys already know how picky I am. It's no surprise that I would hate thumbprints on my screen. It's also the same reason I generally don't like a glossy paint job on a tennis racket, partly because I feel like it clings to the skin a little bit more, which is annoying when you're holding the racket in a certain way and you just want to pull away real quick. But also fingerprint magnet. It's more appreciable, appreciable, is that a word? On cars, but cars that have like a matte or a satin finish, which is best achieved in my opinion by wrapping the car, not necessarily painting the car because matte or satin paint once you get it scratched, you can't buff it out because if you buff it out, it'll just buff out to gloss. And then you have a gloss spot on a matte or satin finish. You should wrap your car if you want it to be matte or satin. I almost did, but it's too much money for what it's worth. Wow, there's a dog wearing goggles. Oh, I wish that could have been caught on camera. Dude, there was a dog sitting in the back seat of a truck wearing like snowboard goggles. Why? Because it was raining? There must be a sensible reason for that. That's one of the silliest things I've just seen. Oh my God, amazing. We're on a real short drive here and we're already seeing some crazy stuff. Anyway, talking about matte versus gloss finishes for tennis rackets, the reason I think it matters more for a car is because on a car, there's like all these body language details, like there's lines and curves. That kind of stuff comes out a lot more when you have a matte or satin finish. The thing with a gloss finish, especially on a car, because rackets have all these crazy graphics on it, right? But a car is usually just like one standard color. The gloss finish just reflects everything, like all the road lines, the trees, the sky, the clouds. You look at the car and it's almost like distracting. 
with how much you can see in the reflection. So I think part of my preference for matte over gloss finishes comes from just feeling that way about car finishes. Also, I'm not really a car guy. I didn't really give much of a hoot about cars until this came out. Actually, I uh, drove a Prius before this, which is super cool, right? The Prius is such a funny car because it's actually fun to drive a little slow. <laughs> All these little like reward systems built into the car, which makes it feel like a video game that kind of reward you or uh, coerce you into driving slow. Keep the RPMs low enough, you can still use the battery and the engine won't kick on and you're like, ooh, okay, I'll keep it like one mile an hour below the speed limit to achieve that for as long as possible. All right, we are at the destination. Hopefully not too many people are out here watching me talk about a tennis racket on a walk. Gloves off, just one glove. Ah. <sighs> All right, let's switch microphones again and get into this Extreme Pro review officially. All right, I mean head extreme tour. I've messed this up so many times by now. I even uploaded a short saying pro, and then I had changed the name later to tour. Head has made it so hard to keep track of their racket model names. They don't even make a pro model of the extreme. And in my head, pro and tour are kind of interchangeable. I think different racket models over the years have used those terms differently. Tour and pro, they're both like up there. They're both usually the heavier or the heaviest rackets. But in head's case, I think the pro is usually above that. But again, they've mixed everything up. Head is well known for having made it pretty hard to keep track of these things. So. Sorry for anyone that was triggered that I said pro, I meant tour, and hopefully I don't mess that up again. But if I do, it's head's fault. All right. It's so nice to get outside from time to time. Look at this sky, it's crazy. Give you a little tour of the area here, or a little panoramic view, I should say. Hi. She's overly friendly. <laughs> <laughs> Seems very friendly. All right, so what am I gonna say about the Head Extreme Tour? It's a racket that made me think about how rackets are marketed and also how consumers talk about rackets, especially when you think about what a racket gives you. One of the things that's become somewhat conventional wisdom or just a really common talking point is control or power or spin and the idea of a racket giving you that. Now, when it comes to power, now I understand this, but it does frustrate me a little bit. A lot of people talk about power as something that you need to generate yourself. Nobody really talks about control being something that you should generate yourself. Instead, people say you should generate your own power and then get a control racket. That seems to be a very common way of thinking. But I feel like a truly good tennis player should be able to generate their own control and therefore appreciate the power a racket can give you. Because now you already have the control, you can generate it, but also tap into the power potential of a racket? That's crazy. Oh, this bug is really trying to get up in my lens. Get out of here. I thought one really good way to sum up the Head Extreme Tour was almost to say that this racket gives you a lot of free control, which I feel like is worth saying because it's also such a light racket. I think, I'm going off memory here, I could be wrong, but it's Tennis Warehouse who said that the swing weight average is 317. I think mine came in at about 315. Might have been a little lighter. I strung it with restring zero and I think I may or may not have measured it with a dampener which would only add a couple of uh, units of swing weight anyway. Point is that's quite low, especially for a tour level racket, right? Which again goes back to just like, what is head doing with their names? Whatever, that is neither here or there for this video. This is really random, but it smells so intensely of licorice here. There's a lot of licorice plants and I think everything just got bulldozed. You could see all this vegetation has been flattened out, probably to reduce the risk of fire. And I just got hit in the face with just like licorice. That was very intense. It's kind of nice now though. I got a combination of that after rain smell and that licorice smell. So yeah, the Head Extreme Tour is an interesting racket because it's so light but it's also very controlled. Typically control oriented rackets tend to be on the heavier side because that's the type of player that it's being marketed to. And I think a lot of people who get the extreme tour, almost said pro, are very likely to add weight to that racket like lead in the head, lead in the head, because it almost feels necessary with that racket. But I played with it pretty much in stock form. Again, put restring zero in there, one of the best strings of all time. I think I strung it at like 46 pounds. I know it was really close to that. I'm going off memory now. I've been trying so many rackets, you guys, but it was like mid forties. And that actually felt just about right. And I went with that because the string spacing was very similar to that of the Regna and the E-Zone 98. And I generally believe that if the strings are more closely spaced together, that you'll probably want to go a little bit lower on the tension because the tension of each string is more closely spaced. You know what I mean? It's more tightly distributed. 
So yes, some strings have a denser string pattern, as in more strings, but I really think that how close the strings are together is a huge, huge factor in what the good tension will actually be. So it's a racket that you could think of as giving you free control, but it's very light, it's very swingable. I think it's super accessible for a super wide range of players, even beginners. Just because it's so light, it's got so much accessibility because of its low weight and its low swing weight. And I think also the idea of getting somewhat of a control racket that's so light, which is really rare to find. The Extreme Tour is one of the few examples out there. Could be a great racket for beginners because it would allow you to swing so fully without the ball just absolutely flying way out of the court. So in some ways, I think you could develop a better stroke with a more control-oriented racket. Another cool thing about the Extreme Tour is the spin potential. I'd say for a control-oriented racket, it actually has quite good spin production, even though the string spacing is kind of tight. So you get a lot of control and you get good spin. Other than that, I'm not really sure that the racket has any standout features. I don't think it has really good plow through. Again, that's probably mostly just a weight thing. One of the most common questions I got was if I felt like the racket was really unstable. Now, I don't know if I felt like the racket was inherently unstable. It's hard to separate what felt unstable based on just how light the racket was versus whatever might just be unstable about the racket. So my answer to that is like, no, I don't think the racket felt any less stable necessarily than what I would expect from a 315 or slightly lower swing weight racket. I'd say in general rackets don't really feel that stable until you start getting into the 320s or maybe even the 325s. And that 325 has to partly come from weight somehow on the racket around the three and the nine area because that will stabilize the twist weight axis. It's starting to rain a little bit, I don't care. Maybe I'll start walking back the other way just in case. But my point is there with the swing weight is that you can bump a racket swing weight up a lot and it might not do much for the stability because if you put weight right on the 12, it doesn't really help stabilize the racket on the three and the nine axis. So swing weight is not necessarily an indicator of stability. What is going on there? Oh, did you guys hear that rattling sound? I think it was like a dragonfly that was getting, got caught in some of these knocked over dead vegetation, whatever this is, I don't know, some kind of grass. That was weird. I love dragonflies, they're like my favorite insect. They're so cool. Oh, wow, a lot of them are actually out here. And yeah, I actually don't have too much to say about that racket. It's fine. I thought it's really cool that it offers so much control in such a light package. But unless you're kind of a beginner, I don't really see you getting away with that racket in its stock form. It's just too light and not stable enough in stock form. You do get good access to spin and good access to control, but I don't really feel like there's any standout features of that racket. It seems to have okay feel. Comfort, decent. Again, if anything felt kind of harsh, it might've just had to do with how light the racket felt. So I wouldn't call that racket necessarily harsh or comfortable, just pretty average. Comfort would definitely increase, I think, with weight because it would have more mass to absorb the shock. Now, if we're talking about superficial stuff, I'm not really a fan of the paint job. I think it's cool with how many rackets head has created an aesthetic by matching the racket paint job with the grommets. I think that's really cool, but this whole like kind of pastel avocado color, I don't know. I will say though that I really like the innovation on head's grommet system, a lot of their rackets at least, not everyone, but I think they call it the spin grommet and they have this really cool oval shape, which means on one, axis, the grommet is really narrow, and on the other one, it's pretty wide. It's a really clever grommet design because it allows it to be big in the ways that are nice for a grommet to be big, but it negates the issues that I have with a grommet being big, which really just has to do with crooked crosses. So the head grommets are really innovative in the sense that they allow for more string movement in the right direction. And yeah, if you just take a look at it, you'll see what I mean. So big shout out to Head with that innovative grommet system. I'd actually like to see that on more rackets. I think any racket that has a big grommet, big enough to show that horrible issue of crooked crosses that drives me absolutely insane. I'd love to see that on rackets like the Head Speed Pro, for example, because that's a racket with big grommets, but they're just circular, so the crosses get all crooked. I'd love to see that on any Wilson racket with big grommets, especially the Shift. I really want to like that racket, but that's one thing I just can't look past. And if you guys want to see more content on what that's about, I've done some videos on crooked crosses. You'll see them on my channel if you poke around a little bit. So yeah, sometimes Head does that innovative spin grommet thing. Sometimes they don't and they just have a generic big round grommet. And actually on the Gravity series, I think the MP Tour, which you can only get, I think in Europe, and the Pro, they just have a very small circular grommet. Check out how narrow this path is. Ah, oh, and how spiky these are. Look at that, so spiky. It's called Star Thistle. So I guess I'll turn around once again. Is this the plant that smells like licorice? No. 
Where is? Hmm. Oh, it's a little further out. I'm not going to walk into that. Anyway, I suppose that's about it. I don't have a whole lot to say about that racket. I didn't love it. I didn't hate it. I didn't really find any standout features that really caught my attention in any profound way. But I do think it's very cool how spin friendly it is for the kind of control that you get. And I really appreciate how light it is. But it begs the question, why would Head call that a tour model racket? I don't know. I guess in some ways I would complain if it was obnoxiously heavy and then therefore nobody could use it. You can always add weight to a racket, so that's kind of cool. A lot of professional players on the tour actually use rackets that in their stock form are super light and therefore highly customizable in terms of weight and balance. So a true tour racket might actually just be on the lighter side. But as far as the consumer market goes, most tour and pro model rackets are closer to the weight that a real tour or real pro racket might be after customization, if you know what I mean. But it leaves less room for customization, of course. So I guess I have slightly mixed feelings about that. Maybe I'm just hung up on how confusing the naming has been for Head recently. And yeah, Head kind of feels like they have too many rackets. In some ways, I feel like the extreme and the radical could kind of just blend together. Like they could probably take half of the models out of each of those and just combine them into one line. Maybe even the same for the Instinct. Those three lines are just not that distinguishable from each other. Like no more distinguishable than another model in that same lineup would be, you know? And I'll say one thing about Head too. I think they're spreading themselves too thin with too many rackets because while it's nice to have all these options, I suppose, you can only have so many players on the tour represent so many rackets. Like Babolat hasn't diluted themselves with too many different rackets, which is part of why they can so effectively endorse or have one model endorse. Like you can have Rune, is it Rune? I don't know. Alcaraz, etc. all endorsing that pure arrow 98. But if you're head, you're all over the place because who's going to endorse the head boom, the radical, the speed pro, the instinct, the gravity, you know what I mean? It'd just be so much more powerful if they had three of their best players endorsing one racket instead of like Djokovic on the speed pro and then Zverev on the gravity pro. And then I guess Andy Murray endorses the radical, but you can pretty clearly see that he has that prestige style grommet, but I think it's actually an older liquid metal. So that's pretty obviously not that racket. I mean, none of these guys are usually using the racket that they endorse, especially on head. I think uh, Alcaraz actually is, and Rune is using the Pure Aero 98, so that's a little more honest of an endorsement. But yeah, I think it just hurts head sales to water down the potential for endorsement on their rackets because they just have so many rackets that they can only assign like one player to one line at a time before they run out of high-level players. You see what I mean? Like, what if Djokovic and Musetti, I guess, who's kind of their higher or head boom pro guy, and Andy all were rocking that Speed Pro. And they have Berrettini, Berrettini, with that Extreme Pro, right? Did I say Extreme Pro again? Oh my gosh, Extreme Tour. And I think Gasquet also on the Extreme Tour. I don't know, I just feel like their roster and their racket lineups are really diluting the potential to effectively market their rackets. And then is also just confusing for the consumers. And then on top of that, they keep interchanging the Tour and the Pro. And then sometimes the Tour model isn't available in America, like the Gravity Tour you can't get here. I don't know, I think Head's got things kind of messy and confusing, and I think it's hurting them a little bit. I suppose they're probably fine. I just feel like they could be doing better, and I also just don't see the point in some of their racket lines being separate lines. I really think they could cut like two or three of them and just start combining models, and they could concentrate those endorsements a little better and get the word out more on a racket like the Extreme or the Radical just by having more players focused on fewer lineups. All right. Well, I suppose that's all I have to say about that. I appreciate you guys coming on this walk with me and I'll see you in a future video. If you guys want to support me, there are links to do so in the description. You can buy my favorite products with a discount or go to the Amazon storefront. I get a small commission there and you can also buy me a coffee. And if you do, I will shout you out in my next video. All right, let's end it before that leaf blower gets any louder. See ya. Oh yeah, just look at how much more dirty it is now. Now that it's dried up a little bit. Oh yeah, look at all that. Nice. So happy about that. So happy.